Welcome to That's Just How It Is. I'm your host, Erica Monique Williams, and today I have Dawn Breeden, the author of Remember to Breathe. Welcome, Dawn. Thank you. I wanted to talk to you about your story. Um, I've, I've known you for a long time, but believe me, this book is, I mean, it couldn't have been written by a better person because you've had a lot of instances in your life where you have had to push through a lot of times, um, tragedies and, and challenges. Absolutely. So please tell us about um, your story, your life. Um, my story has, my life has been, and it's funny because I always say to people, it's my life really just, that's just it. But it's been very, been very challenging, Erica. But I always tell people I was prepared early on myself because I used to listen to like motivational tapes and books and things. So when life took me to my knees, and it did, I knew that I could pull through. I knew that I was going to be able to, I had to go through the process, I had to feel all the pain, I had to feel all the love that I got from the community, which was a good thing because you know it was, this community is a small community and we're close together. But I think the first thing, ironically, I wanted to be a motivational speaker. Okay. And I really and truly believe in my heart that God said wait. Because prior to all the things happening that were traumatic, where I was just reading books and listening to tapes, and I would say, think positive, Erica. But I really couldn't tell you how to pull through something, because I really hadn't been through anything. So I really believe God said, wait. Okay. And I think the first thing that I was hit with was when I was diagnosed with HIV. Okay. So I was five months pregnant with my first child. Okay. And I was 31 years old. So at 31 years old, being five months pregnant, I wanted my baby. Right. And it was back in 1991. We were just starting to hear a lot about HIV. About HIV. And it was one month before Maddie Johnson went public. Okay. So it was a topic of conversation for everyone. Everyone was talking about HIV. And HIV equals death. Right. And I had this baby inside of me. So the first thing I did was I decided, I made a decision at that point that I was not going to die from HIV that I was going to do whatever it took to take care of myself so that I could be healthy for my baby. I was told that I needed to have an abortion at that time. Okay. And again, I said, you know what? Like I, I have prepared myself. I have a strong faith in God. And I prepared myself and I said, you know what? God's not going to let me have this baby and let me or this baby be sick. So I was determined that I just okay. believe this. Now, doubt starts to step in. Let's keep it real. Okay. Doubt starts to step in. And literally, I had to overcome my doubt with my faith, just believing that I was going to be able to pull through. Now, I'm honestly the first person that I told when I was HIV positive was my baby's father. Okay. Because he needed to be tested. And being from Bergen County, Bergen County, we didn't have a lot of people that were HIV positive. We didn't talk about being HIV positive. And there was a stigma attached to it. So the stigma, we didn't do here. So I didn't fit in here. So when I was told to have an abortion, I was scheduled. Not I scheduled. I didn't schedule the appointment, but it, an appointment was scheduled for me down in Newark. Because they literally said, we don't touch people like you. And I said, no, I'm going to get another test. So I got another test. Of course, it came back positive. My son's father did not want to be tested in Bergen County. So we went to Passaic County. And back then, you couldn't be tested together. So you went in one room, he went in the other, and it took two weeks to get the results. And they were literally the longest two weeks of your life. Well, that kind of tells how long ago we're talking about. You said 1991. Absolutely. Right? Okay, so from that point, going and getting tested and tested again, and knowing that you're carrying a baby, what happened with your relationship and your child? I immediately stopped having sex with him, so he couldn't say I found out and gave it to him. He said he was negative, which I found out years later was a lie. He was positive. So my message to everyone is always, you have to get tested together. You know, and the people say, well, you, you're bringing mistrust into the relationship. Unfortunately, I don't make this up. This is just the way it is. He told me he was negative. 
So we remained friends. And when I had my son, he was a very good father. He was very accommodating, took care of my son. But I kept saying something was wrong. And many times we get into relationships and we overlook things. And you know how you get that feeling when something's wrong, but you don't, you don't no, know you exactly don't know what, what it is. is. That's right. And I said, you know what? Something's wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. But like a long story short, and I know we don't have any interest of time, and we started a very bitter custody battle. And my diagnosis was at the head of custody battle. The judge said, given your HIV status, we don't know how long this child has. So we're going to give joint custody to the father. Now, I'm not opposed to joint custody because I have to know that children need both parents. Right. But I kept saying something was wrong. And because I like to talk, you know, I'm a motivational speaker, because I like to talk, they said, she's exaggerating. He's a woman. She's talking to him. And of course, the stigma of your illness and the exactly. people having prejudice. Which against. one? Because I don't Exactly. Know. So what happened? So after going in and out of court for two and a half years, when my son was three and a half, he poisoned my son with cyanide and ammonia. So my son didn't die because I passed on HIV. He died because of a stigma of what people think about people who are HIV positive. Now, although my son was HIV positive, he was very healthy. He never had any childhood illnesses. He never was hospitalized and never on any medication. So he was very healthy, but because of the stigma again. And then I had to go through the rumor mill of being in a small town. And everybody was talking about me. Right. Well, in your book, there's a part where you say um, it's not, and I'm going to read it because I tell to remember it. It says that I can honestly tell you that I know what it feels like when the whole town is talking about you, and trust me, it does not feel good. Now, we're not talking about a high school rumor. We're talking about something that was new. It was, it was a, a deadly disease, mm -hmm. and then you had to deal with your child being murdered at the end of Exactly. So people weren't talking about necessarily, they were talking about my child being murdered, but it was more so, oh, she has that disease. Oh, she's dirty. She's nasty. So they're even blaming the victim. Exactly. There's no compassion. No. no one is feeling sorry for what you're going through. Exactly. It's, it's almost like you did it to yourself. Exactly. Okay. And that's what people would say. Right. They would say, they would come to my friends and say to me, oh, but she, you know, but they really didn't know the story. And they really hadn't heard. And literally people were, I walked into the post office and people would literally back up. You know, people that I'd known all my life. Because, you know, I was born and raised here, so people I knew all my life. All the time they back on you. Yeah. I was looking at, I went to the supermarket, and people would point from across the floor. How do you deal with that? Because an another part of your book, um, which I read and I loved, and of course this is my copy that was signed, um, at your first book signing, um, it says, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Father, I thank you. Now, how can you thank God um, for something That was a like process that? also, Erica. Okay. I mean, because everyone, it's normal to say, why me? Exactly. It's normal. Exactly. But how do you get past that? It was a process also. I knew that I was going, I just knew just God was going to help me pull through, you know, the beauty was I did, even though I did have all the rumors and I had a lot of people saying some nasty things, I did have some people that were supporting me, okay. you know, and it felt as if my friends were standing right beside me and it felt like the whole community was pushing them closer to help me, to hold me up. Well, that's when you realize who your real friends are. Exactly. And you, I mean, there's all, and, and sometimes it's the least, uh, the last person that you would expect to be there for you in your time of need. So 